He is a multifaceted speaker who's got experience as technologist, serial entrepreneur, angel investor, and mentor. Please welcome the VP of Solutions Architecture at Aerospike, Sunkat Gaguli. You guys can hear me, right? Over there? Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, cool. So, my name is Sukant Kangoli. Uh, I'm the VP of Solutions Architecture for a company called Aerospike. You see the logo uh, over there? Uh, before, going in, before coming to Aerospike, uh, Aerospike is a startup which is based in Mountain in California, and then we have teams in California as well as in India. A bunch of customers here, and you know, expanding globally the business. Uh, I've, uh, before uh, joining Airspike, I was the CTO and head of products at another startup where I had the opportunity to work on IoT. I spent two and a half years building an IoT solution, taking it live uh, from concept to design to actual customers and, you know, what do we have to do, you know, to get the product online and all the operations aspect of it. So what I'm going to do is, in today's, today's presentation, I'll start talking about Internet of Things uh, in a short form IoT, and I'll uh, I'll I'll, I'll verbalize uh, the experience that I went through building it. What are the things that I had to do uh, as as a CTO, and more importantly as a product builder, and then uh, beyond the motivation and and the technology, taking the product live, and some of my learnings, and then the last few minutes of the talk, I'll talk about uh, uh, the elements of Internet of Things and and some of the relevancy from RTV or real time bidding and and you know the similarities that I saw you know coming into Aerospy for a lot of the customers of Aerospy currently at tech space at advertising technology space uh, and uh, some of the things that happens in the RTV which is a completely different segment than Internet of Things and the commonalities across them so that's that's the talk about I'll keep it informative stop me asking me questions if either I'm going too fast if I'm not, you know, understood properly, or any of the points would make sense, please, you know, stop and ask questions. This is a little bit of who I am, uh, but don't read all of these things. I'm a technocrat. You know, I build, I build startups, I build products, uh, I take them to the market. I, you know, right from the point of uh, conception to design to making sure that the product makes market sense making sure customers appreciate what it is, and then actually launching it and you know, operating it. So that's what I, that, that's my background. A lot of my work over the last, uh, I would say, uh, 14 years, I've been in the industry for almost 20 years now. For the last 14 years, a lot of my work has been in the infrastructure side. I've done a lot of systems, backend, scalable IO architecture, network security, uh, multimedia protocol systems, and so on and so forth. So that's essentially what this thing talks about, <coughs> that's the bottom line. So before we start uh, talking about Internet of Things, uh, this, is, this is my sort of definition of what an IoT is. Uh, and, and this is not from the sources, but when I started building it, based on the characteristics that the solution offered, I came up with things that actually makes you know, the system work, and that's how it sort of coined up my informal definition of what an Internet of Things is. And I have a, another slide which will talk about something from Wikipedia and, you know, what they talk about and what it means. So it's, first, it's an ad hoc formation of an overlay network. It works on uh, Internet, so it works on the classical TCP, IP, uh, mostly, and then there are some which run on I mean, pure Ethernet. So some on layer two, most of them on layer four. Uh, and then there are higher level protocols. I mean, there are some networks which are running. As a matter of fact, one of my uh, solutions ran on HTTPS, which is layer seven protocol, if you will. So it runs across the board, but it's more important to understand it's an ad hoc system. It overlays your existing network, so you don't have to disrupt anything. You don't have to recreate a network from, from scratch. Nothing, no, no fundamental change in the network architecture is required. That's very important. The connection overlays on, on your existing infrastructure. Uh, exchange of information between the devices is what Internet of Things is all about. It is about uh, smaller entities which actually take a life form and start communicating in the network. It has an effect, and that's, that's 
that's where the entire industry is all about. I mean, the entire industry is running out. And we'll talk about the effect in the next few slides. But essentially, these are small devices, and some of them are, you know, really, really minute. Some we have in our wrist, some we have in our mobile phones, some are extensions that are sitting in our cars, you know, in our, in our home networks, you know, our thermostats have been live, you know, made live today, and various other devices, you know, the smoke detector and so on and so forth. These are all inanimate objects which start communicating, start sending whatever they can actually sense into a central system. Most of the exchange, I use the word PDU quite a bit. Anybody who's from the networking world will understand. It's packet data units, essentially the payload that is moving back and forth. That's what the PDU means. I wanted to keep the sentence and not overlap it. That's why I use the short form. Most of these networks actually use small data chunks moving back and forth. That's the classification. Now, uh, there are extended solutions which may send a bigger data, uh, data payload, but generic IOTs that you see will have smaller payloads. It's an important element, and when, when I talk about the similarities with the RTB, I'll show you where it makes sense. And then finally, I'm uh, sorry, I don't have a clicker with me, otherwise I've got a pointer. Uh, hub and spoke architecture. A lot of the IOTs are essentially hub and spoke, and then you have either one central star formation, or you have layers of star formation that works into the network, which is how our internet works, right? You have networking where you have class C, class D types of addressing mechanisms and then you have different types of net masks in which you build your hierarchies. So IoT networks are essentially, even as they are an overlap, they mimic similar architecture that your classical network works today. So I think you know today uh, you, you must have heard Internet of Everything, Internet of People, Internet of Things. There's a lot of Internet of X is happening. All all we are trying to all we are trying to uh, formulate is uh, in the Internet. It's not just the laptops which are sending or or our mobile phones which are sending information out. There are other entities that are formed which will send their own networks. And whether it's the Internet of People which we all live in today and we socialize our information or the Internet of Things, which are little embedded devices which are running on the network, they are not very different. Only thing the volume increases in, in an IoT environment. You will see more nodes communicating. You will see smaller data, but a large volume of data aggregated together coming into, into the central system. This is, this is what Wikipedia talks. This, this is how Wikipedia you know, documents what Internet of Things is. This is from the Wikipedia site. It's essentially an interconnection of unique identifiable embedded devices. And these devices today, are, you know, uh, all, all of the devices that exist today have some computing power. Some have a bigger scale at which they compute and some have work on a smaller scale as far as competition is concerned. So that's how Wikipedia documents the Internet of Things. It's essentially computing devices or end nodes which are distributed all over the world and they somehow find ways to talk to a central server and then keep moving information up in the layer. So uh, networking existed for 20 some years. You know, companies like Cisco's and the world, Cisco's and Juniper's of the world have been existing, doing business for over 20 years. Why is an IoT so big today? Why is it such a big deal? Why are so many companies and so many businesses being formed in the space? There are a few growth drivers, which is where the Internet of Things is actually becoming a mass market solution, a mass market product. There are some growth drivers associated with the, most, the three most important things which you hear is the reliability in, this, in, in the network has evolved significantly. Anything that can actually connect to the network, the maturity in the technology has brought in the reliability but it will stay alive if you can make sure they can be powered properly. And there are some other, uh, other elements which actually show the, uh, the drivers that I will, I will document which makes these three things uh, you know, work very well. The reliability, the availability and the serviceability. These are three important elements for an IoT network to work. You want to make sure when a device goes in, it stays there and it's functioning all the time. You want to make sure that the, uh, the hardware architecture and the software architecture, they may seem very complicated or they may seem very simple, but the combination of you know, both, both, both the software and the hardware forms a real reliable system. 
availability, if the system is live, if the system is connected, if it's powered, it has battery or you know power sources powering it. If that is the case, then it will communicate. It is reliable. You can always reach it. And, and then the service ability factor. You want to make sure these devices, uh, when they are placed in, if you want to upgrade it, you want to upgrade the firmware, the hardware, the software, or even upgrade the capability of the device, you want to make sure the serviceability is an easy factor in this network. There are pipelines where oils are flowing today, which has IoTs monitoring the system. There is nuclear power plants today where energy is being generated through nuclear sources, which is being monitored with the Internet of Things. So simply factor is very important. You can shut down the pipeline just to fix a small monitoring aspect of it. So you want to make sure every characteristic of serviceability is taken into account. And then the most important thing, today it is possible. The next three or four slides will show you why it is possible today. It is possible both from the technical point as well as the business feasibility. Technology is matured enough that Anybody can go build one. It's out there. You don't have the unreachable factor anymore that stands between us and building a solution. And then from the business feasibility point of view, there are business needs. There are applications that need these things out. You're not building an esoteric product which nobody needs. You'll be building something that people need. In my house, I have three devices that recently, the last six months, I, I got purchased, which is actually sending information out. Classical IoT is functioning out there, and it's a commodity product. It's a commodity segment today. Extremely open. I mean, this is this this has changed the industry significantly over the last seven, eight years. Adoption of open source in the consumer networking space was a huge deal. Enterprises started adopting it today. Open source is a big, big demand. It's not a nice word. It's a must-have now. Every business has an open source aspect of their business. And the more open source you have in the system, the better quality of product comes out, the better understanding of the product from the consumer's point of view comes into picture, and you have a wider mass who understands about the product. It's not just the buyer and the seller who sits in Silicon Valley or in Timbuktu who knows about the product and we consumers buy it, if it works, it's great. If it doesn't work, tough luck. Open source has changed that phenomenon. Significant amount of open source exists in the Internet of Things today. A lot of open source exists in the Internet today, but a significant amount, a much higher fraction of open source exists in the IoT systems today. So I talked about some of the drivers which kind of drive uh, the, the growth of the business, right? Uh, from the technology point of view as well as from the business point of view. The first important thing, this is the cost reduction factor. I have documented, this is a little dated information. I don't have a revised uh, quotation of the numbers from the, uh, the device, the networking devices and the cost factor associated with it. But if you look at the cost factor reduction, these are significant drivers in the segment. Today, these products are selling in the market a fully functional product, packaged, uh, serviceable and supported product, sell in the market for 50 to 100 dollars. In a, in, a, in, a, in a huge volume. So the components which are required to build these things have to be very, very low cost. And with the cost compromise, there is no compromise in quality. You look at the, the GPS controllers from $1.25 to 70 cents. The GPS has actually become richer in the feature it offers, while the cost has reduced 40, 50%, close to, close to 35% here. So, Every element out there, as it has matured in technology, which means manufacturing cost has gone down, the scale at which you can manufacture is as much better, much wider. Businesses who want to go into manufacturing these things, it becomes an easier entry for them. Barrier to entry in these things are much lower now, which also means for us who want to build this, we have a wider choice. There could be literally 50 Bluetooth uh, LED vendors out there that you can choose your components from which wouldn't have been the case five years ago. So the cost reduction is a huge factor, but the cost reduction only happened because of maturing in the technology. As technology matured, you saw minimization on the footprint, but that was will, that will not have a compromise of the quality. We talk about similar things in the software side as well. So this is, this is the first factor that drives 
the growth of the IoT. The second thing is the bandwidth growth. Uh, I remember uh, I have used uh, 56 kilobit data for a very long time. I used to dial it to BBS to figure out what is happening in the community and who, who's doing what. There were probably like 200 BBS groups that I, I could actually, that existed that I could dial it to. Today, there is no concept of dialer. We are, all of us are running close to 40, 50 uh, megabits uh, in, in, the, in the homes today with you know, Comcast of the world or, or, or charters of the world right, presenting the technology. There was a time when um, uh, 10 megabit was a huge deal within an enterprise. People used to run 10 base key poppers and now we have 10 gigabit switches which are available for under $1,000 that you can run your small businesses with. So bandwidth has grown significantly. And the cost in the bandwidth has dropped. Again, this is a two-year-old slide. I actually have a paper as well that I published in June of, uh, of this year in a conference in Taiwan. And some of, some more technical details. And I, I can give you the URL. Of the, the paper is going to be published in a journal, which is, uh, which is the December uh, issue of this year, uh, which has more details about all these things. Uh, but if you see the growth in growth in the mode of bandwidth that is actually available to us, and the bandwidth that we get in our mobile phones and our, and our laptops and desktops, as well as little devices that we use, has increased significantly. And then the third, and extremely, extremely, extremely important, uh, latency crashing. This is a huge deal. This is a little, you know, the squiggly thing that you see keeps on turning around on your mobile phones. That latency reduction is a huge deal for us. As latency reductions become sort of the way the business grows, there are better opportunities of serving information to our customers. There are better ways for us to consume a variety of data in different formats, in different media today. They, so these three things uh, have driven the growth of IoT as a, as a vertical segment itself. And then you, you will see that it has gone across multiple spaces, right? You will see bigger companies which are minimizing their networking equipment into smaller entities that you can distribute. Wi-Fi access points, you will see a lot of these things and they aggregate, go to a gigabit or a 10 gigabit channel which is aggregating today. So these three things have a huge impact on where we stand today with IoTs. Now let's talk about my personal experience of getting this. I started this thing around early 2012 when I started looking at an IoT, and there was there were there were talks about IoT. There was a lot of academic papers about Internet of Things. As I said, in oil, oil, oil and gas industry, there was a lot of Internet of Things, and you know, uh, aeroplanes, and there was a lot of Internet of Things and huge networking pipelines and so on and so forth. But let's talk about something which is very very consumable, very simple that you and I experience, and more importantly, we can build. So that's what my experience has been building an IoT system. The first started with the need. What, what was essentially the need? Uh, you guys are in New York. I come from San Francisco. We both suffer with the parking problem that exists today. Any cosmopolitan, any crowded city in the world has this problem. Uh, I don't have much experience about New York, but there are times when I spend 45 minutes in San Francisco trying to find a parking spot. 45 minutes. For a one-hour meeting, I have to spend 45 minutes to make sure I can get a spot to park, make sure it's not illegal and it's not towed, and I can actually pay somebody and make sure when I come back, the car is there. Huge problem. So this was a big, big segment. It's a huge industry, massive, massive industry. As, as you know, uh, uh, as a business, but what was IoT? How was IoT related to that? And what could IoT do for these things? So I'll talk about that in the next few slides. As as I started looking at the market and trying to understand what could be done, I saw that there was a lot of these existing sensors, but they were sort of their own silos. They were proprietary systems. Only the vendor who built it knew how it worked. Nobody else could there was no way for that vendor to actually connect it to any of the existing public system. Nothing existed which allowed that connection to happen. 
So because it's proprietary and because it's in low volume, it's very expensive and it's 10 years old. So the only way you can do it is a $2 million project. You go in, set it up, and then hope for the next five years that nothing breaks. If it breaks, you have another million five to go fix it. That's how the system worked. So given where we stand with devices like $399 mobile devices, mobile phones, which are very, very reliable. As a matter of fact, I can live without my laptop, but I cannot live without my cell phone. That's an old one, by the way, but anyway, I still cannot live without that. So the amount of reliability that I have over there is much higher than this $2,900 laptop I have with me. So if devices like those can be that reliable, and can, you know, can stay with the usage that I put it through day in, day out, and still stay alive, we can definitely go find things which would be as reliable, if not you know, exactly the same level of reliability, and maybe a little cheaper, a cheaper cost. Those were some of the thought processes as to, okay, let's figure out what we need to do. Now, when, you, when we started building these things, I started, I wanted to go figure out you know, what we have to do out of the segment world. So, you know, just like you guys, when you go build your businesses or you build a product, you want to understand what the requirements are, and you also want to know, beyond the requirements, how much of it do you understand, or your group understands, your team understands, and how much you want to go procure from outside. So that's the exercise I went through. I started figuring out what are the things that I know that I can manage properly from my past experiences. I did a lot of work in networking, so I knew that there was some amount of knowledge that I could bring to the table, but were all of them relevant was a question. And, and to do that, I started going into the city garages and into the parking lots and talking to the attendant and what, you know, sitting outside and watching these guys go in at four o'clock in the evening to 7.30, which is like prime time traffic, and see how this whole system works and figure out what the inefficiencies were. And while doing that, you know, whatever knowledge I had with some of the existing solutions out there or existing components out there, how do I solve that thing? These are some of the scenarios I'm sure you guys are experienced with. So there is there are two things that I really wanted to address in my solution, in the first version of the solution. The first thing I wanted to address was this factor of knowing which one is available, which one is not available. You see the little spot between the red Jeep and the white, whatever the thing is. That spot is available, but who knows where it is. When you go into these garages, they have those signs, 27 slots open, but you don't know which, which 27 they are. So you have to go, go back and forth, trying to figure out which one is available. But I know that 27 once I enter the garage. I don't know that 27 when I'm 15 miles away from the garage. What could I do as, a, as, as an architect of a solution to figure out how could I make that connect work? Those are some of the requirements, right? The other thing beyond this was as cars go in and out, is there a way for me to know how many go in and how many go out? Simple mathematical problem. 50 seats available. How many come in, how many leave? If I know at any point of time, I know exactly how many occupy it. I don't have to know, I don't have to count it. So that's the mathematics I applied. So if I know how many spots are available, and I know how many came in over the last five minutes and how many left. And before I started my transaction, my transaction count, how many were already present at any point of time I could predict. But for me to predict from outside, what would I do at the entries and the exits to make it work? So these were the riddles that I, these were the challenges that I had with me to go solve. And if I could do that thing, think about what, what miracles could happen. If I have to go to a meeting 45 miles away, I know exactly how many spots are available, how many, how many parking locations are available in you know, two blocks from that spot. I would know exactly how many cars are in there because I somehow figured out the entries and the exits of it. And the last part, icing on the cake here, if I could actually reserve it while I'm driving or before I take off from my home. If I can tell somehow that I'm gonna be there in 45 minutes to an hour, reserve my slot. When I come, I'll pay, or I can pay ahead of time. I want it reserved for at least two hours, because I know exactly what time my meeting is. I have a rough idea what time my meeting is gonna end. If I can solve that problem, all the driving around, all that 45 minutes, is a huge win. Now think about the person or the group which is running the city, 
and they have to worry about the transportation. There's a massive, massive win for them. Think about what would happen if you have a Super Bowl event going on, and you have a stadium, and there's three routes coming in and two routes going out, and the one who's in charge of the distribution. How good it would be for them to know exactly which routes to route when. Today, they, any ideas how, they do, how, how do they do that? They send people over there. There are people standing, counting how many are coming in, how many are going out. It's a manual task today. But if there was ways to allow IOTs to solve this problem with simple hardware, relatively complex software, mobile devices, you're sitting fat and happy with a huge business. Those were some of the requirements that I had in my hand when I started solving the problem. Some of the some of the you know wins reduce city traffic huge deal. I'm, I'm, you know as I said I don't have, I'm preaching to the choir here because you know anybody and everybody who drives knows what the problem it is, uh, specifically in a congested city. Uh, congestion avoidance, people hitting each other, fender benders, anguish, frustrations, heart attacks, so many things happen. Right, all of these things have been minimized. And then, I mean even yesterday I paid two dollar very cheap gas two dollar ninety five cents. Plus then four dollar twenty three cents, four dollar sixty cents per gallon. If I don't have to spend so much time going back and forth, and I drive a minivan for crying out loud. It's a huge, I mean, huge problem for me. My wife doesn't let me drive the train, she takes it. So I have to drive the minivan. And if I'm in the city with a minivan where there is only left gear and no rights over there after four o'clock, and you can only turn after seven thirty, which I don't know and I will never remember, it's a massive problem. So these are all social problems that we are paying a huge deal with. We all live with it. IoT was a very nice way to figure out. IoT was a very nice segue to figure out how to solve this problem. Now, how could you do that? You know, what are the things I did? We'll talk about this. One, one thing that I didn't mention, which was the biggest win with the product, with this segment. Any guesses? Yeah. The money for the city? Sorry? The money for the city? Parking uh, yeah, money for the city for sure. Uh, but, you know, this, uh, airlines have dynamic pricing. If you, if you book your tickets, I booked my flight tickets two days before I came here. Spend a heavy price for that. Airlines know exactly what time, when. Dynamic pricing has been there for years probably, and it's been working well. They applied it for the first 15 years, and now for the last 8, 10 years, it's been working well. Hotel reservations, huge dynamic pricing solution. Parking doesn't have a dynamic problem, a dynamic pricing. Today, if I have a parking lot, if I'm sitting in Chicago, and my parking lot is in New York, I have no idea what goes on. I can only go back and see what happened yesterday, after it was done, to try and figure out what's going to happen today. If there's a huge event out there, I don't know how to price this thing. Government, uh, government properties have you know, less variation on which they can change, but the private parties change significantly. Giants played you know, the baseball, the, the game, the, the baseball championship that just happened a month, month and a half ago where Giants won, the parking lots next to Giants Stadium, on an average used to be 22, $20 to $22 a day. In the game, during the game sessions, it went from 22 to some, as we got, got closer to the finals. It started going to 60, 75, 80, people paid $120. And this is all guesswork. There is no mathematics associated with it. The guys who priced it completely guessed it. And then you, because the supply is so short, what would they do? People will come and pay for it. So there is no concept of dynamic pricing. But if there were ways for IoT and the software in the IoT to figure out how to price this thing based on exact scenarios, then you can sit anywhere and you have an exact mathematical projection of what your business's revenue is going to be, how well the system is performing, 
what factors would allow the prices to change and have backings why you change that thing. If I'm running the show in a parking lot and somebody told me why did I take the price from $22 to $45, I have no answer. I have absolutely no way to justify that. I'll talk about here's my gut feeling. I think this happened. You know, my guy told me that four people were lined up. I, my general lot is two people queue up, so I just doubled it. But there is no mathematics associated with it. With an IoT and software, you could exactly predict, you can exactly predict what your revenue is going to be. And the nice part about it, the manager who's sitting somewhere else trying to figure out how much money the business is going to make is going to look at the chart, change things on the computer, and say, if I change, if I increase the price by $5, let me see how many drops are going to happen. And the system will project and give it to them. So this, this was a huge deal. It took me a year to figure out after my first version of the product went live that there was this gold mine sitting underneath. And this was all because of the IoT framework that was built. So what, I mean, I come from an engineering background. I had to follow some engineering process to figure out, okay, I understood exactly what is happening. Now let me figure out what hardware components, what software solution, what was the architecture I have to put in place, what were the programming languages I have to use, and all of these things come combined together to focus on my solution. So started started looking at and exploring uh, what, were, what were available. The first thing I knew that I wanted something in the Bluetooth range. I knew Bluetooth, you know, BLE 4.1, which is a reliable version of Bluetooth, is an interface that I needed. Because there was close proximity, tighter, you know, tighter uh, spend in the network, network protocol, but close proximity that I was dealing with. So I wanted to make sure that something with Bluetooth is available. Bluetooth exists on the mobile phones, most of the popular mobile phones. And BLE 4 is sort of becoming a standard now. So given the fact that I was designing this thing two years ago, I knew that by the time the solution is live and mature, Bluetooth 4, you know, 4 Plus is going to be standard in most of the smartphones out there. Because I wanted the smartphone to drive my interface. The next important thing was, because I was, you know, IoT is all about sensors, I was building sensors. Now I'm going to install those sensors. I can't have those sensors changing batteries every two weeks. I have to make sure that once it's installed, I have enough, you know, enough battery power that sits over there for the ones which cannot be powered, right, through the through electricity. Enough battery power that could last anywhere between three to five years. So I'm not going to go through all the details, but if you look at it, I started looking at all the interfaces that is required, and then as these interfaces were, you know, started coming up, based on those interfaces, there was software that needed to be designed to handle that. So the, uh, there are uh, two acronyms here, the AEP, which is essentially the aggregation endpoint, and the TEP, which is the transceiver endpoint, essentially. Uh, if cars are coming in, there is a central thing where automobiles come in and out, which is essentially my aggregation endpoint, which is aggregating feeds coming through the cars, through sensors in the streets, sensors at the entry points, sensors at the gate runs, sensors within the car, maybe, right? Uh, my phone becomes a, 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 a transceiver endpoint because it's communicating, right? And, and then the aggregation endpoint. So I knew that there were at least two different types of hardware components that I had to build. And as I was designing those two components, I was trying to figure out, as like, you know, you guys, are, you, I'm, I'm assuming you guys, a lot of them uh, are doing software. Maybe some also have hardware experience. Yes, no? So, so, so when you're designing, you know, for software it's very clear. When you're designing something, you want to make sure you can reuse it. You're not going to custom build everything, right? Write something which is generic enough, but not bloated. At the same time, if it's generic enough, you can try, you try and use it in multiple layers. That's exactly what my thought process was. I need something which is event-based, real-time, really fast, can handle a lot of tra traffic coming in and out. But it has to be a really small device, right? And then, the ones which are aggregating is going to get a lot of these really small packets coming in, and when you put them all together, it's a huge amount of data. But that cannot be a big behemoth either, right? So you have to design systems in that manner, which works. So once, once, once I got to this level, that's where either the elements of hardware, the elements of software, what kind of databases, what operating systems, 
how near time it needs to be, what are the latency factors associated with it, how much of network dependencies do I need, how much of 3G or 4G dependencies I have. All of these started becoming inputs that me and my team started working on. Now comes the backend system. At the end of the day, all these feeds are feeding information in and out. Somewhere it has to go together. It has to come to a little hub where everything comes together. That's where all the, all the judgment is done, all the decision making is done. Who gets priced, who gets, who gets to enter, who has violated the last two you know, payments or whatever it is, and what can I do to block those kind of stuff. Right? Everything has to be aggregated together. So now we are coming to a classical backend, web, database, you know, uh, load balancer, network aggregators, all of these things come into picture. And because these are information which has some amount of personal information that is passing along, my phone, my credit card, my information, my device IDs, there's not any security in there. Everything that we do for web-related businesses. This is what a, a scale-out architecture, we deal with this a lot on, on, on a daily basis. This is what some of our customers use. Some of our customers have you know, worked with us to get to the stage so they can actually have a scale-out architecture rather than a scale-up, right? Now if you look at it, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a point, otherwise you have the consumer who's sending information through multiple channels, mobile, web, tweets, which is also a, a hodgepodge of web, uh, you know, uh, chat, information through television networks, information through radio networks, any kind of channel coming in, comes into the central system, which is essentially front-ending the request. As soon as it front-ends the request, its job is to, as the request came in, go back to the back end and get some data or get some information and push it back to the client or the consumer. For that to happen, there are multiple things. So many connections are coming in, you can't really have one device handle all those things. So now we start putting in load balancers so we can balance traffic coming in. But all load balancer is doing is making sure that the entries are taken care of. But what happens to the back end? Who's going to solve that problem? Right? So there are some solutions which will actually load balance themselves to the back end as well. The back end databases. Now you have started, you have the home code caching systems coming into play. You have existing memory caches out there which will be plugged in. And then some would start having data affinity, some would start storing state, and some are completely, you know, without any state, or as stateless as it can be. Uh, this, this is a very generic design, but 90% of the businesses have some form of this. And some of the tools that people use, right? Nginx is the Apaches of the world, and the Nginx, which is very popular now. Programming environments like Node.js, which allows you to do, you know, single-threaded or non, non-scheduled task, if you will. Everything is real time, meaning request comes in, it fulfills the request and gets back. There is no putting the request in the backlog and you know, those kind of architectures. And then you, you have vendors like Aerospike, and then of course there is Mongo's and Cassandra's and other places of the world who bring in the NoSQL technology on the table. And, and the goal of that segment is to essentially provide you an edge environment so that the front end request can be handled at a faster pace. Because clearly, the back end systems are not going to be in the position to handle. Databases, a classical, existing, traditional database, handling tens of millions of connections is not practical, not possible, even with a lot of money. So you have to sequence things out. You have to move things into fast paths, and you have to move things into slow paths. And then you have the worlds of Hadoop, where there's a lot of batch processing of large data. Some take four hours, some take, some take 20 hours, but nothing in, in close to being near real time. So there are several states of you know, software architecture that comes into play. And I had to build a system like this for my, my solution coming in. I'll, I'll talk about it when we, when we took the product live. The first version of the product live, I had uh, 10 cities and then it was 14, and I think it's a much larger number now. And uh, the way I did my math about how much data is coming in and how, you know, how my system, because it's an event-based system, lots of events are generating information out. Started with 2 million events an hour. Within three weeks, I was doing over 40 million events an hour coming into the system. So I had to make sure that I didn't bankrupt the company 
paid for to the bandwidth. I had to make sure my system could handle that traffic load. I had to make sure once the event comes in, there's a lot of information, valuable information that is coming in that the business needs. We data mine that information that is coming in, and it has to be as real time as possible. While I'm looking at how many cars are in the lot, if one gets in, my counter on my mobile device should immediately go down. Because there may be one spot that I was about to register a, a book for myself, and a car went in, and immediately got out. So you can't give false positives to the customers. Very important. Right? So when, when you have to build a system, back in system like that, all these components come, in, come into play. And you know, I, I tried out several of these before I came to a spike. I tried out Mongo. It did OK, you know, and then it kind of fell. And then I had to go figure out, oh, I can do something better. And I started writing my own. And then that took time. And then I figured out the knowledge that I had in my startup, the previous startup, and the skills that I had, I couldn't go build a fast NoSQL database. I didn't have a skill set. So then start looking at what else out there. That's, not, that's how I bumped into Aerospike. I've known Aerospike founders for almost two years now. I, I'm with the company for almost four, four months now, but I've known the founders for a while. And I you know, had conversations, I came and did a presentation a tech talk over there, a meetup, an equality for meetup over there in Silicon Valley, explained what I was doing and explained what, what my needs were. And, and started figuring out what out of that system would I actually leverage in my solution. I'll quickly go through a couple of reference hardware design. These are block diagrams, so it's not very complicated. I'm not going to spend too much time. Uh, I believe this slide will be available. So, so this was, this was my aggregation endpoint. It was a small device, a little two inch by four inch, uh, two inch by four inch by one and a half inch, so rectangular device. Uh, it had to be weathered because it's sitting outside in the, in the garages and, and, and you know, exposed to you know, rain and heat and so on and so forth. I had to make sure that this device, I'm a small startup, so I don't have a lot of resources. And these devices are going to be installed in several places, all over the city, all over the country, across two different countries. We went live in US and Canada, and we were in conversations to go live in Europe. So I, if, if there were upgrades to be made, if there were fixes to be uploaded, I should be in the position to do best case, sitting in my office in San Francisco, click, and it goes pushing all the data out to all the networks, all the devices. Worst case, there are, you know, Technical field agents who go out there using their mobile device, their you know mobile apps or, or or you know the laptops allow Bluetooth channels or other Wi-Fi channels to push out feeds, buff fixes, enhancements, and so on and so forth. Right. So the first thing I went and did was when we were building up this network. Once I put in a good scalable system, a backend system which will handle you know gazillion transactions per second, I made sure that there were all interfaces which are available which had enough security in place, so you could push out feeds, bug fixes, bug, bug fixes, right? When you do software, you know it's a major, major pain. When you have software running as a service out there, it's a, it's a nightmare. First, you want to make sure when you're going into a compliance system, I was a, you know, I, was, I had a payment network running in it, so I was a PCI compliant platform. So I couldn't just push data whenever I wanted. I wanted to make sure there were certifications for every, every fixes, every major fixes that I did, and more importantly, I made sure that we did, we sat in San Francisco and made sure all these devices. We had systems running in Chicago and San Francisco, Seattle, uh, Boston, uh, Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto, seven, there was many, many cities I can't remember right now. But all of these things were running, and I had to make sure that all those things could be managed and monitored from a little email office in San Francisco. And we got to the state where we could handle it. And these were my transaction endpoints. Now, interestingly, I had a transaction endpoint which was a mobile application running on mobile app, um, sorry, on iOS and Android. And we also ended up designing a little device which sits in the car, that you can plug into the car. A little consumer device. It cost me like $38 to get at a month at a large volume, which allowed these interfaces to go in and out. So you don't have to use a mobile phone. You can just use your car, which is, which is what you do when you go into a parking lot, and let the car be the identity system. So this 
this is a simple uh, animation which kind of documents how the system works. In, in, a, in a garage or any of the uh, uh, entry exit points, you'll see there are a couple of loops. You'll see the data they put little sensors out there. There is an arming loop and there is an exit loop. And they have logic associated with the arming loop is when your system gets active to do certain things. When you get into an airport and you're about to park, you, get, you, know, you have to come close enough and that's when the machine starts speaking to you. Right, push the button and get your ticket, whatever. Right, that's essentially the army loop. As soon as you push that thing, get the thing out. As you move ahead, you cross the exit loop. That's when the arm blazes and you walk out. Right. So the car comes in. Army loop gets activated. Traffic goes from the device because there's a little sensor thing is sitting over there. Goes into the device cloud. The device cloud, with two different cloud apps that I had built segregated it well enough so that I could have, I could offload traffic and data processing across them and still give real-time capabilities in it. So the aggregation goes into the device cloud, it manipulates some, some manipulation of the data happens, then it talks to the app cloud, which is where all the user identity is kept, make sure it's the right user coming in and so on and so forth. Goes to the exit loop. You see the location ID and so on and so forth is identified. This is all managed in the exit, exit cloud. And then, conclusion, you know, car opens, you know, a transaction is started. And all those things happen in the cloud along with the IoT sensors which are communicating. So this is the complete data flow of how, how things work. With a mobile, this is how the system works. With a mobile, you can scan, or if you have an NFC, you have an NFC tab. Mobile device, since it, it has its own identity stored in the, in the device itself, so you don't need a secondary IoT transceiver. The mobile device becomes a transceiver. It's passed to the, uh, the app cloud. App cloud does its own business logic, remediation, passed to the device and tells the device, okay, this is a valid user, I know who it is. It's credit card or her credit card is valid, it's charged, user is confirmed, let it get open. And this, of course, happens in, you know, less than two seconds, so you really do not see the difference. It takes longer time to get the phone out and tap it, and before you, you know, keep your phone down, the system is all done, and you're ready to go in. So you basically get a valet capability without paying for the $35 valet. So some of the characteristics when you were building these systems, right, the data for operations, some parts, when, you, when you're building a system, when you're building a software solution, some of it you can define what you want, and some you have to integrate into the existing solutions providers yeah, network. So we have a system where we could leverage our own traffic and our own encryption protocol, and some we have to actually pay back with our existing transport layer, which we did. Some we had to run on our own because of the compliance factor, and some which didn't have the compliance traffic could run on another channel, but on a secure network. That's what we did. And we made sure, made sure that we went with, as I said, it, at the beginning of the talk, uh, when you're doing an IoT, you will see IoT is in layer two of the protocol system, layer four, and some in layer seven. I did practice layer seven myself. I had an HTTP interface to each device, which means I could sit in my office and look at each device, control each device, shut it down, I'll push a new firmware, bring it up, look at the entities which, yeah, which is functioning, look at what interface is working well, look at what is actually overloaded or what is not functioning properly every parameter I could monitor. A very small, high-level network here, where you see the entries and the exits, where you have the transceivers, you have a local router. This, the local router is a standard router that you can buy from you know, uh, retail stores. And then it connects through the network, through the garage router or the aggregation point, basically your uplink network, and then goes through the WAN link in the network. So what ends up happening is, the little network here, it creates its own proprietary secured LAN. So you could, you could have multiple entries and exits and they would run their own LAN network. So you don't have to worry about taking away IP addresses or other resources from an existing system. I could run my own LAN without having to worry about it. But the most important thing is we have to address the LAN, the network address translation, which you guys must have heard of, in NAT. So I could see devices which are hidden inside the network. So I have to build a protocol that could bypass that. So, what were my learnings? 
First, for the first 15 years in my career, or 14 years in my career, a lot of the solution that I had built was extremely complex, very, very complex. It took a long time to build, it took a lot of money to build a lot of people. And then I had to sell 20 of them to make a lot of money. Everything was proprietary. There was no concept of open source. A lot of it, I mean, every, beyond just simple basic IP networking, everything was built on its own. My first switch that I built, I built my own IP stack. Nobody talks about building an IP stack today. And I wouldn't dream about doing it today. But when I had to build it, performing at the level that I had to, I didn't have a choice. There was no open source. Today there is out there. You know, you have, even the IoT frameworks, there's a few out there that you can actually use. You have to make some changes to make it work for your application, which is a lot what a lot of uh, people use. That's why the slide that I talked about open source is a huge deal. To build something like what I did today, if I had to do on my own, it's probably a three-year project. At least, at least five to seven hardware designers, and somewhere in the range of thirty to forty software developers, backend, database architects, uh, you know, uh, scale architects, and so on so forth. You know. Uh, Front-end designers, front-end programmers, back-end designers, back-end business logic designers. Uh, it, it's an army. Because everything has to be built out from scratch. With a lot of the open source components, we didn't have to. The first solution went to market in like five months or so. It was on a very small scale, just to make sure that the proof of concept works in a live environment. But on a very small scale, but four or five months. And you know, thank you, open source. So we, we, we went through, you guys didn't ask me any questions, but we went through a lot of things about IoT. What I did, how I did, why I did, right? It was all in context with the Internet of Things solving a specific problem. And when I came to uh, Aerospike almost four months ago, and then I started talking, I'm a technical person, so uh, you know, <coughs> even though I spend more time talking and traveling and working with customers, trying to close deals and so on and so forth, I always want to understand the use case, even the existing ones. I want to know how they're using it. I want to know how and why, you know, the way they're using it benefits their application. And given the fact that we have a decent amount of customers who have, who, who have been practicing real-time bidding as, as their product for several years with that product, I spend a lot of time trying to understand how they're using it. And then what I started doing is looking at, you know, correlation between what an IoT does, and what RTB does. So these were some of my findings. One thing was very clear, first, you know, we didn't really have a whole lot of thinking to do or a whole lot of reading to do. There was a lot of data coming in and out, lots of data. And the packet sizes were small. I mean, in some cases, the packet sizes keep on growing, right, because they're trying to study more and more about the user from a, from a real time. If, if, if the system needs to know who I am and what I saw in the last two hours and which channels I saw it through, it needs to understand who I am and what I have seen. So for that to happen, it needs to know that I, the same user came through a mobile phone. You know, I went home, I came from my iPad. In the office, I'm coming from my laptop. In, in, in laptop guys, I'm at the airport kiosk. I log in from those little mini bags that they have in some of the airports today. But it's the same user. If the same user is coming in, you don't want me to see the same ad over and over again. It's a very bad user experience. First, they're trying to learn what I'm trying to do, and they're trying to match it. And the second thing is they want to make sure they don't repeat what I'm seeing. Because if you want to do those kind of elements, there's a lot more information you start storing in. Some of it is throwaway, some of it is transient. You need it for a short time and not for a long term, right? But you're growing the information. In the IoT, the difference that I saw was small packets as well. But you know, as as the IoT start covering more and more segments, I mean, uh, Nest came up with uh, a little term stack. There is another company called Leo, a close friend of mine who started this, which is doing uh, carbon monoxide. It is recording my voice if they see any anomalies happening in my house. It records my voice calls me on my mobile phone to make sure it is me and there is nothing funny business going in the house, right? So a lot of, as these guys, as these products are increasing their footprint, not on the size, 
but for print on the feature, they are going to slowly and steadily start collecting more and more data, which is what RTV has been doing. Extremely fast. You, as you're collecting the data, you need to store that thing, even if you're storing for two hours. You need to store it because you have to do some things with it, which means you need something which can hold the data at that pace. And we're talking, you know, gigabytes, gigabits and gigabits of data coming in. Right? We're talking tens of millions of connections coming in to the mobile devices, to the webs. Right? Each one is asking for information. If you look at the IoT equivalent of it, sensors, I mean, there are 10,000, 15,000 sensors in a small system. Each sending data sunk in minutes. Think about the data center which is collecting that. So, if you look at the, the, the characteristics or the, the flow of the application, they're similar. The domains are different, but they're similar. And at the end of the day, when you collect all the data, some you store, some you throw away, but you want to make sure they can store it fast enough. At the end of the day, you want to make sure you can do certain things with the data. Now, you're not running KN all the time. You're not running, you know, large, complex algorithm which takes hours and hours to solve those things. A lot of it is simple matching. Level one matching, level two matching, cancer goes out. That's where real analytics, real business analytics, this is not PhD analytics. This is real business analytics, that's what the industry is today. Every bit of the business lies around that. So you want to make sure you have infrastructure that you're building which can handle that. It can handle the scale, it can handle the volume, it can handle the variety. When you have these three things, and of course, you have to be reliable. You know, when we're talking about data, you can't get the data and dump it. That's a cache, that's not a solution. That's a band that you put in, right? So, because the data stores there, because the data is being consumed at that pace, you want to make sure you can do certain things with it. You try and your algorithm identify what variables are important, what is not. Which means the cardinality of the data is changing. One business looking at the data and figuring out which variables may not be the same as another business. That's the value proposition we create. We want to make sure my search algorithm, my matching algorithm, my comparisons are faster and better than somebody else's out there. That's how we stay in business. Question. Yeah. So how do you choose to how do you choose the RTV domain to draw a parallel to? Would that just did that come to, come to you intuitively, or for the other like? If it was more intuition, because I mean it's very simple. It's a human human thing. If if I was a hundred meter sprinter, and I did that for a long time, when I decide that I'm going to go from hundred meters and I build stamina, I'm going to run ten thousand meters, right? I try and pick the elements that work very well for me in hundred meters. I may not use all of them because I know that, I'm familiar with it. So when you look at the problem, I mean, if you, if you know certain things in mathematics, if you're looking at another problem, you will try and see what in mathematics you know, then you can make some changes to solve this one. It's a human intuition, right? So, you know, and I'm sure everybody does that, right? You want to make sure whatever knowledge you have, let's see how much you can leverage. How much can you change, but how much you can leverage? So you're not a newbie in that space. You come with a leg up. So when I started looking at it, RTV, which was new to me, the first thing I did was to find out some good articles out there, some good papers to talk about what RTV is and what people are doing. The best thing is look at what the academics talk about, because academics are generally five, seven years ahead of what the market is actually doing today. Right? And you know a lot of the things that the academics are talking about is probably not realistic because of resource requirements. But at least it gives you a good picture. And that's what I did. I went and read like six or seven papers, and then went and saw who is following what. And a lot of the information is out there. I mean, is a lot of the information is out there on the web. So that's how this thing came along, saying, oh my god, I mean, I can see a lot of similarity. Not exactly, because the consumption and the domain and the application is different, but analytics, everybody needs it. Everybody needs it. RTV is not, real-time building is not just an ad business everybody's doing as today. Every product, this, I, you know, Joe was doing RTV. Everybody's doing it in some fashion. So there's a lot of similarities. You have to figure out which part of that similarity applies to this current vertical. So that's, this effort was essentially trying to figure these things out. 
And when I got this opportunity to come and talk, I said, let me talk about a practical example of what I did. Some of the thought process, I mean, I, I did it in 57 minutes, but it took a long time to get there, practically. Right? And then what I cherry picked was the things that I could actually talk about, and then figure out how do I match them into you know, the real-time bidding segment. But more importantly, more than the real-time bidding segment, if you look at some of the common components out there, I mean, I use Aerospike, I was not doing an MTP. So, you know, that's how you start mashing things together. Okay, so I talked about analytics, which is, which is a pretty, pretty important factor. And more importantly, you know, we have seen the Hadoops mature, and we have seen that some people are coming out of Hadoop saying, it does things, but it's pushing me back 10 years. It takes a long time. I still have the coffee problem. I still have the lunch problem. It started, let's not lunch. We'll come back and see if it's done or not, which we did in the order transaction case. Only thing, we did it with $3 million devices. We didn't do it with you know, $10,000 know, computers. What is happening is that analytics has to be faster and faster and faster. Time is very important. People want to make sure that the results are coming out very, very fast. So you have to go figure out which solution are out there, which components are out there, which allow you to do the matching faster. And as you start figuring those things out, that's how, that's how you start building up your stack, right? So basic, the basic conclusion of this thing was, I was trying to figure out what of my experience flows into this segment, and more importantly, if I'm trying to convince that I know the segment, I should have some fallback on why it makes sense. Because I wouldn't go build one to say, oh, let me tell you what I did, right? So that's where we are. Anyway, so that was my last slide. This is my coordinates. Yes? Wait, wait, hang on, hang on. Before you take questions, I just want to quick, uh, take a quick pause. Give a great big round of applause to Sukhant Ganguly. You had your hand up, right? Someone should have their hand up. I did, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so, how, what's the timeline do you think to get to the point where the IoT devices will be able to be programmed in modern programming languages like Python or Ruby or something like that? Uh, it is at its infancy today. You can do it today, you said? It is at its infancy today. Yes, yes. So you, I mean, there are computing. Uh, I'll give me a second. There are computing nodes out there, which can actually run a Python VM. I'm a big Python fan, by the way. You know, uh, I did a lot of C, C plus plus. I started with assembly because there's nothing else. These things are usually programmed in C, typically. It is. It is today. But there are there are virtual machines going into the space. The nice part about this is, you know, since you got me started, I'll spend a couple of minutes here. The nice thing about it is, when you're doing something in a virtual machine, and if you have a virtual manager, as you put in new logic in, you can kill this virtual machine and start a new one, right? So it is so easy to add new stuff, and if you have enough juice, enough processing power, you can have multiple VMs running. You don't need VMware, you don't need $35,000 you know, equipment to do those things now. So, but it's, it's, it's an infancy today. Give it another three, four years, you'll see a lot more virtual machines running. Yeah, wait, actually, before you take that question, I forgot one other thing. We are giving away these awesome Beats by Dre solo headphones. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to enter for the raffle, um, Joel's got a um, vase <laughs> to throw your card into. So, uh, we're going to give it away very shortly, so please put your card in there. Uh, yes. So you've talked in terms of the, uh, the amount of data collection and the hardware you're talking about. Go back to your example in terms of your, get your car out of your garage, you drive into the city, you look for the parking space, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, how many bytes of information are you collecting as a result of that? How frequently are you collecting? What's the size of each one of your records? And yeah. tell me about it. Average record size, because there were different types of transactions, average record size was 625 bytes. The maximum I went to was 2,000 bytes in any one flow. In, uh, as I mentioned, I had 40-some uh, million events happening in an hour that I was collecting. 
I had around uh, 30,000 active connections at any point. 30, 30, 31, somewhere in that range. I'm just talking about the one trip. Oh. So just, just, let's say you're the only one on the system. Yeah. How much does it, how much are you monitoring? How frequently are you, are you updating your database? How big is each one of the records? 625, 625, 2,000, 1,400, and 625. One go in and out. And uh, I, I can't do the time because, you know, how fast they go, when they leave, is, is, is a question of the driver. So I can give you one, you know, one flow, I can, the other flow timed on the user, right? Okay. So again, what's the number? Under 5,000. Under 5,000. Okay. Under 5,000. Uh, yes. Yeah. I didn't see uh, any message of an AMQP or similar. How do you, do you feel that that has any place in dealing with these? Uh, I I used zero MQ and modified it. Okay. It, zero MQ is you yeah. know. Yeah. yeah, we started out using that and moved to some custom rabbit solution with MQP, but we're struggling with dealing with large volumes of connections and figuring out where to scale. So uh, I I started with MQP and I knew the connection, the ins and outs of the connection. I was the connection going in and out very fast. MQ would not scale. So I had to take zero MQ and then write my own uh, connection and I don't have to it. Zero MQ, sorry. And write my own connection and I don't have it. Yes. So this is more like a generalized question. So, uh, I mean, what I believe is for this IoT Internet of, Internet of Things to really work is when you have each of this device have their own unique I IP address. So in that regards, when IPv version 6 really comes into play, that's when I really see the potential of all these devices coming together and working in unison. Yeah, actually, you know. Uh, <clears throat> Any thoughts about that? I don't know if it disappeared. But I had a slide when I had this little, you know, oblong shaped object here with devices. And I said I ran my own LAN here. So I could run those LANs, thousands of them, in the same subnet. Okay. So I manipulated two layers of IP. Okay. Yeah. And then device IDs were more unique rather than IP address, because IP address could be reused. Right? And just one more thing to add to that is that. You know, we've been hearing about this whole net neutrality, you know, with this, this government oh, trying to, you know. So if that really happens, you know, then that's going to be in jeopardy because you, you'll see stifling in innovation. What's your take on that? Uh, I, I don't think I can comment. I don't think, first, I know enough about specifics on this. And secondly, this is more of a political problem rather than a technology <laughs> problem. Okay. Just from a, from a tech point of view, just like, you know, we all supported open source and we all love it and we all practice it, I think enough innovation happens when you share. Okay. You have to worry less about protecting because I don't think copycat is an issue today. I think even with copycats, people are innovating and creating their own differentiation. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. All right, time for just one more question right over there. Uh, you talked a lot about the It was hard. It was very hard. Uh, two things. First, what I was doing was I was putting a lot of transparency in the system, which means if I am in at the gate collecting the dollar bills, then I, I generally don't report it if I'm doing that over there. Because nobody looks at me. How many go in and out? But if everything is monitored, then I can't lie anymore. If, I, if 500 cars parked, there has to be 500 cars worth of money. That's a hard problem. Because you're going and telling the customer that I will make you honest. And they have a good colorful language for me. Right? So that was hard. And the second thing was, given the fact that there were devices which took, you know, six months to install and set up, and $3 million, and once it is done, as I said, you pray to God that it doesn't wait for the next five to eight years. And we were talking about devices which would be you know, $2,000 for a large garage, $5,000 for a large garage. So we were never considered serious. So it took a lot of selling and a lot of showing and, you know, let me simulate it, let me on my line do the work. You try it out for two months and then you call me. 
So it's, it's, a, it's a hard problem. It's a hard problem. Okay, so kind of, we'll be here for one-on-one -on -one questions. So anyone who didn't get a chance, uh, you'll feel free to come up and walk up and ask him uh, right after our raffle. And I want to give a great big round of applause to Kanye Thank you. And now the wind beats solo. Joel, if you mind mixing it up.